Ladies and gentlemen, for your boys viewing, and girls, for your viewing pleasure, we bring you dice roll, please. That probably didn't work out so well. <laughs> it sounded like you were, I don't know, clapping your hands really quietly. <laughs> oh, that's kind of what I was going for. Um, so yeah, Dice Roll Please is a new series that Zim and I decided to bring to you. We're resurrecting our old channel because we really like doing it. We're just trying to approach it from a different angle this time. Um, and we're bored, so, so we need something to do. And an excuse to hang out with each other. It's very true. Please support our excuse to hang out with each other. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, what this new series is going to be is we're going to start by exploring a role-playing system that's called Shadows of the Demon Lord. Shadow um, of the Demon Lord, actually. Is it a shadow? Yeah, I've been noticing that when I keep looking it up. It's like, wait, that's singular. Well, there you go. It's the Shadow of the Demon Lord. Because the Demon Lord oh. only has one shadow for some reason. Well, there's only one Demon Lord, and he's only yeah, got but... the one light source. And he's not a finger, yeah, he's not a figure skater where they have 15 light sources beaming on him. But Shadows of, Shadow of the Demon Lord is not going to be the only RPG system that we'll explore. Uh, it's the one we're going to start out with because it's the one we're currently playing, the one we've spent the most time in. At um, least in semi-recent history. Yeah. And to start out with, what is Shadow of the Demon Lord? It's a tabletop RPG made by a man named Robert Schwalb. Um, he has had a lot of experience in the gaming industry, uh, worked on a lot of different games. Like He's done a lot with D&D, uh, especially 5th Ed. Um, what do you do? He's like um, special campaigns or what? Uh, let's see. Um, Don't eat your screen. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Um, let's see here. He had hit the ground running in the role playing industry over ten years ago. Uh, he's got over two hundred different game books, magazine articles, digital articles, and a novel. Um, and his design can be found in three editions of Dungeons and Dragons, Dark Heresy, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, A Song of Ice and Fire RPG, Star Wars Saga Edition RPG, Witch Hunter: The Invisible World. New Menera, the strange and numerous RPG pro oh, and numerous other RPG products. So, in other words, if you do tabletop RPGs, you might want to look this guy up because he might have something cool for you. Right, he's probably had his fingers in something that you play. Um, you can find more information about Shadow of the Demon Lord or buy it either on schwalbentertainment.com. Or on uh, drivethroughrpg.com. Two excellent sources for RPG materials. So yeah, in this in this video, we're just going to do a quick introduction to some of the high-level concepts in the game. Um, and then in the next videos in this series, we'll explore different paths and path combinations. And um, do some potentially do some gaming recaps like whenever we have a play session if something interesting showed up we'll talk about it um, we might potentially record some live gameplay but we're working on trying to find a good video setup for that I don't think it'll work so well but it might well now that we're going to be switching our games to entirely online with an online game map that should work out a lot better yeah but Zim you said different paths what do you mean by different paths? You'll see. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, one of the... the My favorite things about this system is the way characters are created. Um, in D&D, there are, I think, six base stats. Yep. Um, six base stats. In Shadow of the Demon Lord, there are four. There is... Um, wow, I didn't strength. break them down. Yeah, strength, agility, and... In Intelligence and wisdom. Intelligence. Oh my gosh! I need a nap. <laughs> so it's 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 very similar to D and D in that sense, but some of them, some of the stats are kind of combined together. Like strength and constitution are combined. Uh, 
I think charisma is right. mostly combined with intelligence. Um, yeah, for the most part. Yeah, Constitution is kind of um, split between strength and agility, actually. It's constitution. Did, isn't Constitution kind of go toward your defense and stuff? Or is it, it just might. toward your health? I know for sure it goes towards health. Um, it might have something to do with your base HP, too. But we're not talking about those systems, so maybe we'll get to it, and you can find out then. Anyway, so um, the, the stats are, I would say that an average stat for each one would be 10, which is also similar to D&D. Um, the modifiers for the stats is a lot easier to calculate than in D&D because it's essentially the stat minus 10. So if you have 10, your modifier is 0, 11 is modifier is 1, 12 is 2, 13 is 3, and if you go below 10, you're getting into negatives. So basically, take the stat, minus 10. Um, there are other stats, obviously, like health, um, your healing rate, which we'll go over in a little bit. We'll go, there's insanity and corruption and speed and other things. But let's, let's, let's move on from those for a little bit, especially insanity and corruption. We're going to be talking about that later when we get into the world. Um, one thing to note is, <laughs> I'll let you speak in a little bit. There's no experience in this game. Um, essentially, after you complete a, a day, a session, um, assuming you completed what you're supposed to in that session, you everybody levels up. Um, that way you don't have to worry about making sure you kill enough monsters to get up to the next level. You just continue the campaign at a new level in the next part. And one of the really neat things about this game is the way they have multi-classing built into it. Uh, in a normal role-playing game, you have your base class, and if you want to, you usually can bring in the benefits and abilities of a second class, but that makes both of your classes slightly weaker to make that melded character. That's not the way it works in this. Um, you are, for one thing, forced to multi-class in this, and it doesn't really hinder you at all to do this. So the way that it works is you have your level zero, which is just your ancestry. So are you a dwarf? Are you a human? Are you a clockwork? Are you a Farron? Uh, whatever race you have, typically it gives you some sort of starting bonus for this is what your starting stats are. You can modify those a little bit. This is what your abilities are for being this race. And it, it's really just the groundwork for your character. Yep. Um, and then there are three levels where you choose... It's not. They're not called classes. They're called paths in this um, RPG. At level one, you know your first level up, you choose a novice path. Um, that will give you bonuses at level one, two, five, and eight. So your novice path will actually give you the most benefits, or it will determine a lot of what your how your character ends up being by the end um, then when you hit level three you pick up an expert path and so you get its benefits at three six and nine and then when you hit level seven you pick up a master path and you get its benefits at level seven and ten so these these paths can combine in many many different ways so you can have a novice path that's essentially is a warrior which it basically makes you better at hitting things and hitting harder. Um, but then when you get to your extra path, you can actually pick up something that can do magic. Um, and while because your novice path was was based around um, a physical attacker, um, you won't be getting as, mu as strong of magic but they can actually complement each other well because there is magic that can actually enhance physical attacking. That was actually your first character in the system. You started out as a rogue, built into a caster, and I think your final level was a caster too, or your final path was a caster too, wasn't it? Yes. It, well, it was um, 
Mage Knight, which is actually a master class built to be a uh, mix between spellcasting and attacking. Um, basically, it, it there's a magic tradition called battle magic, and it uh, Mage Knight is built around using battle magic, and when you use an attack, a normal weapon attack, then you're also able to do a spell in the same turn. And so it really enhances both abilities. And these different paths, is just something that we're going to delve into a lot more. We'll have entire episodes devoted to different paths. Uh, so this is something we'll explore more in depth in other videos. Um, so a couple of quick the, notes. Um, in, ca in case you didn't catch it by what we just said, the maximum level in this game is 10. Um, and another quick note is... Uh, Gaining stats as you level up, it only happens at the levels where you choose a new path. So at level 1, 3, and 7, there is a rule like built into your path that says when you gain this path, increase X number of stats and stuff. Uh, other than that, it, you don't actually gain any stats. I believe at level 1 and 3, it's you gain a plus 1 and 2 stats. At level 7, you get 3. Yep. And... Uh, the, there might be some paths that come out later, or there might even be some that are out now that will that are different in that way. Um, but since it's built into the wording of gaining that path, they can change it up. It's not a built-in, built fast and hard rule or anything like that. Right. There's some classes where usually you have the option. You can increase whatever stats you want. Some paths say increase your strength by one and one other stat. So yep. it, it's completely customizable for each and every path. Right. Another aspect of the game is you can pick out professions. Um, these professions are things that will give you bonus on different roles that you're trying to do. Um, for example, one of the bonuses that one of the sorry, one of the professions that one of my past characters had was I was an inquisitor's henchman. So if I was trying to gather information or trying to, you know, coerce information out of someone, I could add a, a boon to my role for trying to get that information. And we'll go further into what boons are later on in this episode as well. Yep. Um, obviously, as with most uh, fantasy, this is a fantasy RPG. Um, as, most with, as with most of them, there's magic in this game. Um, and you can pick up magic depending on the path you take, like I kind of mentioned. Uh, there are a lot of different traditions of magic. Uh, gosh, how many are there? There's probably like 30 or more. Uh, I'd say probably easily. Yeah. And um, they, with each book they come out with, well, not necessarily each book or expansion, but a lot of them, they come out with more traditions or more spells for past traditions. Yeah. And then within each of these traditions, there are level zero spells, level one spells, level two spells, level f did I say two, two, three, four, and five level spells. And um, depending on your power level, you can take those different spells. So um, when you t have a path that gives you magic, they also give you power. So let's say you took the mage path for your novice path at level one you would get one power and you would be allowed to take some magic spells i'm not going to go into details about how many or anything um because it because, depends on the class right um but because you have one power that means you can take only level zero or level one spells in the traditions that you choose Later on, you'll get another power from mage. You'll get more from your other paths, assuming you take other paths that have magic in them. Um, that power not only determines what level spells you can take, it determines how many castings you have of each spell. So when you're at level 1, that means you can cast level 1 spells once and level 0 spells twice. And then like when you get to power level 5... You can cast level zero spells six times, and level one spells I think three or four times, and 
and so on and so forth. Um, I was going to say something else. <laughs> While Zim is trying to remember what he was thinking of, one thing I wanted to point out, whenever you pick up a new tradition, because usually it's either you can gain a spell or you gain a new tradition, when you do pick up a new tradition, you automatically get a level zero spell from that tradition. Right. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that I was saying how many castings you have of each spell. You regain all your castings during a rest. So basically when you go to bed for the night. Um, specifically, the game rules specify an eight-hour rest period. You don't have to be sleeping. You just have to be resting. And it has to be for eight hours. So it's very similar to a lot of other role-playing systems in that in that way. Yeah. So let's move on to combat and challenges. Okay. So this is a D20 based dice system for all attacks or challenges. Um, damage die is all D6. And well, there are the, also D3 dice, but because D3 dice generally don't exist, you actually use a D6. Um, but the point is, all you need to bring to the game are D20s and D6s. And this is where those boons and banes come into play. So whenever you have a challenge roll that you're trying to do, you typically, depending on if it's something that you're really good at, you have a lot of, of professions and backgrounds that help lend you to being able to perform this well, you get boons. The way that a boon works is you get, for however many boons you get, you roll an extra d6, the highest number on the d6 gets added into your roll. For challenge rolls, you're just trying to beat the get higher than 10. If you get higher than 10, you succeed. Um, you don't get anything special if you roll a 20. Um, if you roll a 1, though, yeah. If you roll a 1, though, on a challenge roll, uh, your stuff might break or something else might happen. No, the, the, uh, it's not so much. The 20 and the 1 on the, tw on the 20 side of die actually don't account for much. But in this game, uh, they have they tend to have bonuses for rolling a total of 20 or higher while beating the target number by 5. Or something really bad happens when your total is equal to 0 or less, which can happen when you roll low and have banes. Right. Um, but there's no auto... I don't think there's auto success or an auto fail. Well... If as long as you roll higher than a, a 10, it's an auto success. <laughs> well, I mean, like, a d20 isn't an auto success, even if technically the numbers don't add up high enough. Right. Um, there, so, for, like, mo yeah, most challenge rolls, your, your, your goal number is just 10, like he was saying. Um, but, like, in combat, you have a target that you're aiming at. So, normally, with a, a normal weapon attack, you're, it's versus their defense. Or sometimes it's versus their agility, or sometimes it's versus their um, in intelligence or wisdom. I, don't, I keep wanting to say integrity. I don't know why. It's intelligence. <laughs> Maybe you're yeah. intelligent if you have integrity. Maybe. Um, but yeah, so spells tend to target will or intelligence or agility more so than uh, normal attacks. But there are also um, what's called social attacks, and that will attack will or intelligence. Um, so you also add the relevant stats uh, modifier to your rolls. So say I'm making a normal weapon attack, you, I, I'm attacking with strength. If I have 12 strength, I add the plus 2 from my strength, plus any boons slash minus any banes to whatever I rolled on the d20. Right, and sometimes you botch a roll, and you really, really, really needed that roll to succeed. Because if you don't, something really bad is going to happen. One thing that you can get that will help out with that is it's called fortune. Typically, fortune is awarded by the game master for someone who's come up with a, a really good idea or a plan to, of attack. Someone who's been role-playing really well in that session. 
or someone who's made the whole table laugh. Um, that's what we typically do. I, I think the GM can award Fortune at his discretion. Um, Pretty much. But one thing that Fortune can do is it can turn any dice roll that you personally have done into a success. You can use Fortune on someone else's turn to give them it's either an extra two boons or they can yeah. re-roll the die. I think it's just two boons. I think that's right. And I know there's one other thing you can use Fortune for. You can also turn any roll of any D6 into a 6. So if like a if a monster was rolling with Banes and they hit you because their Bane only rolled a 1 or something, you're like, I'm going to turn that Bane into a 6 to make it miss. Or you could turn one of your own boons or one of your friend's boons into a 6 to make it hit. Um, I know we mentioned that uh, damage is all D6 dies, essentially. But the ma- one of the, the, the big things is that damage is completely based off of your weapon plus any talents you've gained through your paths. So... Uh, a, a normal sword is a d6 damage. Um, a longbow is 2d6 damage. I think maybe 2d6 plus 1. Could be. I don't know. Um, a fist hit is just 1 damage. Um, but, like with the warrior, probably, I can't remember what level, he gets something like com- combat mastery or something like that. It says, all weapon attacks deal 1d6 bonus damage. So you add another d6 into your, into your roll. And so that's basically how your damage scales up over your levels is if you're if you're taking a uh, taking paths that are based around physical attacking they usually give you bonus damage dice. And another really unique aspect of this game, something I haven't come across in any other system I've played in is the way that turns work. So there is broken up into fast turns or slow turns. There's no initiative, by the way. Right. Uh, it's all determined on if you want to take a fast turn or a slow turn. Um, players get to take their fast turns. Then enemies get to take their fast turns. Then you go to players' slow turns and enemies' slow turns. So what do we mean by fast and slow turns? A fast turn essentially means you get one action. You can attack, or you can move, and then that's your turn. The advantage of taking a fast turn is if you have a monster in range, or you want to get out of the range of a monster that's about to make you have a not very nice day, you can act right away before they have a chance to. Um, Vice versa, a slow turn, you get both your move and your action. So you can do your attack and move if you want to. So it's really all about strategy. Where do you want to position yourself on the map, and who do you want to hit? And if you're in an area where you already can hit, do you want to be able to hit them before your opponent can move away or do something to mess up your day? Yeah, and like I said, there's no initiative. So the players can go in any order. They can choose fast or slow turn. um, And if everybody chooses fast turns, the players can decide who actually goes first. Each round, it can be different every time. So you don't have to worry about that or doing your hold until until this person goes or anything like that. Um, Another thing is um, triggered actions. If you want, on a a fast turn, you want to just, even on a slow turn, if you want to do a movement and then set a triggered action, which means... You tell the GM, I'm going to wait until this particular thing happens. Say, I'm going to wait until this monster comes within reach. And then I'm going to trigger this action. With the action being, I'm going to attack this guy with this spell or whatever. Or with the, with this weapon. And so you can set up that type of trigger. And that's called the triggered action. That's kind of a, there's kind of two different types of triggered actions and it's, um, it's it messes 
with each other, but they also are linked in a in a way because there's only you can only take one triggered action per turn. So that triggered action, what I was just describing, is um, the setup. Whereas norm, there's other things that say you can use this as a triggered action on your turn to do X. And so that will use up your triggered action, and therefore you cannot take another triggered action this round. Um, and so a good example is Catch Your Breath, um, which says uh, you can use an action or a triggered action on your turn to heal your healing rate. Um, and I think that was, that's all it is for that one. Right. And another one, the priest has a triggered action called prayer. So essentially at any point before someone on your team was going to do a, a challenge or an attack roll, you can pray for them and give them a, a boon or an extra boon on that roll. Um, another thing you can do with triggered actions is they have some potions that you can inject in yourself for healing. You can do that as a triggered action. If you have an enemy that is moving through your square or moving past you, you can do a triggered action to do an attack against them. But yeah, it's again, like, you know, like free attacks in D&D. Right. Or, but you only do one. I think so. They may be triggered. Attacks. No, attack of opportunities in D&D. That's it. But again, you only get one triggered action each turn, so you have to again decide: to how do I want to use this? Right. Do I want to heal? Do I want to do this? Do I want to attack someone when they walk past me? Right. So it's kind of a misnomer being called triggered actions because not all of them are triggered, but some of them are, and even the ones that aren't triggered use up that action. And that's why they're still called triggered actions. So you want to start getting into setting, or do you have more to talk about? I was about to say the last part we're really going to talk about is the setting, so let's move into that. Okay. Um, So, yeah, Shadow of the Demon Lord, it is definitely a dark horror setting. The world is on the verge of the apocalypse happening. Um, Everything is just terrible. Life is horrible. Monsters are all over the place. Not even just monsters, demons. Demons, demons are common. Cultists who are summoning demons or devils or whatever. And apparently the most terrifying thing of all from that I've learned from my most recent games I've been running, pixies. My players are terrified of pixies. <laughs> oh, and we'll Tinkerbell, I'll kick your butt. Um, of course, as this game, as every other RPG game, you can completely control the setting. You can ignore the fact that this is a horror setting game if you want to um and one of the ways that my my group we do that is we ignore the gore it's not blood coming out of that guy it's kittens and rainbows yep every time anything really really disturbing would happen um we're just like yeah it's just kittens and rainbows man we're not even gonna describe it <laughs> And just remember to always have a safe word in case things start getting too dark or too nitty gritty for your players. It's good beyond what they control. Our safe word is pineapple. For no particular reason whatsoever. And I don't think anyone's ever used it. <laughs> nope. Um, the the gore and stuff, and the, the fact that there is so much really disturbing stuff going on in this game is partially because there are game mechanics built around it. Um, there's a stat we call insanity. So basically every time you witness something that a normal person would see and be like freaking out about, you have to roll to see if you would gain insanity, which I think is a will challenge roll. Yep. Um and insanity in and of itself doesn't do a whole lot, but once you start getting higher amounts, I think once your insanity hits your will stat, you, um, what's it called? Is it marks of darkness you start to get? Yeah, something like that. Or quirks? No, you can take quirks to remove some insanity or corruption. I can't remember. Um, so, which... When that happens, something really bad happens to you. Um, like, you could lose a limb. You could even die just from having too much insanity. Um, 
But that's the only permanent one. <laughs> is death. Yeah. Um, Go figure. <laughs> and there's also corruption in this game. Uh, there's no alignment like in D&D. Um, but there is corruption, which is kind of like your good versus evilness. So anytime you do anything that would normally a normal person would consider evil, you gain corruption. Do you... Like if you kill someone in cold blood, uh, if you rob a church or drown a puppy, that's going to gain you corruption right there. Yeah. If you build a bridge out of orphans to get over the lava, you're going to get corruption for doing that. Well, you can just... do it. Just murdering an orphan for no reason will do it. Yeah. Let alone a whole orphanage. <laughs> exactly. But I needed kindling to start my fire. No, that's corruption right there. Um, I think every time you gain corruption, you have to make a roll. And uh, is it a d6? I think it's a d20. Is it a d20? Maybe it's a d6. I think it's a d6, and any time. Um, the roll is less than your corruption, mm -hmm. something bad will happen to you. I think that's when you get a mark of darkness. Okay, yeah. Oh, I'll go into these specifics. Say that again? Insanity, if you get too high, you gain a madness. Yeah. So, it, we'll go into this. We'll probably touch more on this stuff in future episodes to really show you how everything works, but it, 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 we don't tend to do a whole lot with corruption. We're a bunch of good people, so we haven't, have to, haven't had to mess with that much. Um, we play insanity. with Joe's wife. Anytime we get close to being corrupt, she slaps us and says no. Pretty much, yep. I was trying to rob a priest because I was an elf with no morals, <laughs> and she took it away from me and said no. Yep. So I can't. She makes sure to stop us in character anytime out of character won't work <laughs> um so and, and insanity we we've gained plenty of insanity but we've never gotten to a level where it really really mattered um there are some paths or some magic traditions that can really slap on the insanity mm -hmm. uh, they give you some pretty awesome benefits but if you use them, you gain insanity pretty quickly, and you can get some pretty big drawbacks from them, too. We haven't tried them yet, but I, I am, I'm really itching to try one. But I'm such a min-maxer, I'm just like, no, I'm just going to take bonus damage and beat the crap out of people. He really is. If you see the number of dice he rolls for everything he does, it just makes you sick. Yeah. Um... So another thing about the setting is this is typically taking place in a medieval style fantasy world. So you got your peasants, you got your kingdoms, you got your caste systems, your local lords, your ladies. Um, everything's done either on horseback, by cart. Um, so yeah, everything you would expect from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, weapons are swords and and bows and some crossbows and you got shields and heavy armor. It's there not pistols and rifles though. Yes. They're exotic. And they're and they actually come with a pretty big downside because it takes a full action to reload. And they're expensive. And, and, and they bullets have... are expensive. Well, they're not that expensive. Um but yes, the weapons themselves are very expensive. And um, they also have a chance to misfire if you roll badly. So imagine a gun exploding in your hand. Yep. Um, um so they they uh, they have expansion books that come out every once in a while that can that make updates to the fantasy world. Like there's one that talks about Freeport, so it gives you a lot of piratey things. Uh, you even get a blunderbuss, though it's not actually. A weapon uh, mechanically it just has an effect that you can use which you roll a die to see what actually happens they even have come up with an update that lets you do it in a post-apocalyptic setting so imagine getting to play Mad Max um, yeah pretty much and t it basically turns magic into 
not magic. And we'll have episodes where we come out exploring different facets of the world because each book they come out with, it does explore something else, gives you the background on something. Um, there's one that talks about the different religions and faiths. There's one that talks about kind of the history of the world and everything terrible in it. Um, so we'll, we'll go over some of that stuff for you as well. Um, We're looking forward to um, really diving into some of the nitty gritty rules and stuff, but we're actually trying to get permission from Schwab Entertainment to see how much detail we can give you in these videos because as much as I'd love to say, like here's a here's a build of a novice expert and master path and an ancestry, and here's everything you gain from it and everything at what levels. I'm not sure we could give that information out because that's all that information is inside books that you have to pay for. So we're trying so, to see what yeah, how have... much information we can give out. We'll give out as much as we can to make sure you get as much from it as you can. Right. And that's one thing that we also want to include in every episode, except for this one. Um, we wanted to definitely give you a full character, either that we built and played before or an idea that we've had that we really want to try out. Uh, for example, next episode, I'm going to give you uh, the build that I did for my first character. Demias, the changeling priest, wizard, engineer. So if that sounds pretty weird and like, how does any of that go together? You'll have to tune into the next episode to find out. It was pretty interesting. You were pretty bored for the first, for the lower levels. But once you hit, what is it, ten, seven? Once you get your master class, you were having once so I much got, fun. I had a mech that blew up. <laughs> anyway, um, like we said, future episodes, we're going to be exploring different paths, getting into more nitty gritty details of some of the rules and how things work, uh, going recapping gaming sessions, uh, maybe even get some, bring some live gameplay videos in. And even potentially bring in some of our other playing group partners uh, to, to do these videos with us. Yeah, so they can talk about their experiences, their takes on things. Uh, really looking forward to bringing in DJ, our friend who, he runs a lot of these games. He's the one who introduced us to the system. Um, and to tabletop he, RPGs in general. Yeah, I think he definitely has a lot of good insight. I think all of us can probably learn a lot from him, including us. We'll probably learn a lot from him in these videos. He's like, oh, really? I never knew that. I didn't know that pineapple was a safe word because no one ever mentions it in an RPG, so it just doesn't fit usually. Right. I don't know if that's the reason why or not, but <laughs> we can find out. Yep. Anyway, that's all we have for you in this video. Uh, you want to give your special outline today? <laughs> oh, I was going to. You can count on it. <laughs> One last thing that we want to remind you of. Thank you for watching something from BZ Gaming. We are professional amateurs.